Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. It's a great honor to be here today and I welcome all the participants that come from all over the world. We have um, people coming from all our parts of, of the world, so it's a great honor to be here today and to be part of this event. El Instituto Cervantes uh, here in Sydney welcomes you all uh, for this first of quite a few events related to the Synopsium for Crime. Uh, this event was uh, planned by my predecessor, Raquel, which is also here uh, among us, along, of course, with the Instituto Cervantes from Sydney's team. So a great thanks for all of them and a great thanks as well for the participants uh, that will be introduced by our wonderful host, Stuart King, from the University of Monash, coming from Melbourne, um, and uh, he will be the host of this event here today. Uh, as I said, this is the first of several events today, The Feminine Looks for Crime in Fiction, uh, with very interesting participants. As I said before, Stuart will be introducing each and one of them. Um, on this 22nd of April, an introduction to the a Ibero-American police novel uh, and we will also be having quite a few interesting participants so I hope uh, they, there will be also quite a lot of participants in this event. Following the next day, the 23rd of April, um, crime fiction movie, uh, oh no, it's not going to be an online movie, it will be uh, uh, a normal shall we say movie and, and all the um, the places the seats have been taken, so it's quite, it has been quite interesting. Uh, and also, of course, uh, following during the next uh, few days, during the weekend, 24th and 25th, um, an online uh, session also of movie um, in crime. And last but not least, on the 30th of April, we will have a crime fiction uh, debate with very interesting participants. Um, and I hope uh, that you will also find this interesting and participate actively uh, on this also being an online event. Um, once again, thank you. Uh, and I give the floor to Stuart uh, and to all the participants uh, and as well to the members of the um, Instituto Cervantes from Sydney's team. Thank you once again. Gracias, Coral. Thank you, Coral, uh, for that introduction. As Coral has said, my name is Stuart King and I'm a senior lecturer in Spanish and Catalan studies at Monash University in Melbourne. I'm also an expert on crime fiction from Spain. Before we begin today's event, I want to acknowledge both the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne and the Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation in Sydney on whose unceded lands this online conversation is taking place. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Before I pass over to Lilith, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have a question for any of the panelists, please submit them via the chat or the Q&A buttons at the bottom of your screens. And please specify if the, questions is for the, if the question is for the group or for one panelist in particular. It now gives me great pleasure to pass over to my friend and former teacher, Lilith Waits, to start the conversation. Over to you, Lilith. Thank you, Stuart, for that introduction. And thank you to the Cervantes Institute uh, for organizing this series of round table discussions on crime fiction. Um, and I'd like to start by introducing our three speakers. Liana Aramburu is an assistant professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of California, Davis. She's the author of the prize winning book, Resisting Invisibility detecting the female body in Spanish crime fiction, published by the University of Toronto Press in 2019. Her articles covering topics such as female and lesbian crime fiction, femicide and violence against women, graphic medicine, and the 2008 crisis in Spain have appeared in numerous specialist publications, including a special issue of studies in 20th and 21st century literature, which she co-edited with the title set up and shut out, immigration and criminality in contemporary Spanish fiction. She has a number of projects on the go, including a collaborative volume she is co-editing with Nick Phillips entitled Crisis Unleashed, Crime Turmoil and Protest in Hispanic Literature and Visual Culture. Sulari Gentil is a prize-winning Australian author, 
also known under the pen name of S.D. Gentile. She initially studied astrophysics before becoming a corporate lawyer and then deciding to become a writer full time. Her works include 10 crime fiction novels in the Roland Sinclair series, set in the 1930s in and around Sydney, the Hero Trilogy for young adults with links to ancient Greek times and featuring four young sibling heroes, and more recently, a crime fiction thriller of a completely different sort after she wrote him, or Crossing the Lines, which won the 2080 Ned Kelly Award for Best Fiction. Solari also took part in a tour of the US in 2019 to promote Australian crime writing and was recently awarded a grant to work on a new novel with the intriguing working title of The Woman in the Library. Teresa Solana is one of Catalonia's most translated and awarded writers of crime fiction. She studied philosophy and classics at the University of Barcelona and is herself a, pro a professional translator, mainly from French and English. She was director of the translation in Tarasona for six years and has written a number of articles and essays on translation. Since her initial prize-winning crime novel, A Not-So-Perfect Crime, in 2006, featuring the twin brothers Borja and Eduard Masdeu, Teresa has written a further three twins novels, three novels star starring a Catalan policewoman with an intriguing past called Norma Forrester, and two collections of crime short stories titled The First Prehistoric Serial Killer and Crazy Tales of Blood and Guts. Her novels are set primarily in Barcelona, both the wealthy suburbs and the more seedy parts of the city, and little escapes her sharp eye and pen. So welcome, Diana, Sulari and Teresa. Perhaps we could start with the, the obvious question why and how did you choose crime fiction as a writer or researcher for your works? What is it about this genre that suits what you want to say? And Teresa and Sulari in particular, to what extent have your own family and educational backgrounds influenced the sorts of themes and topics you focus on? Perhaps we could start with you, Sulari. It's because crime fiction is a very, has a very natural structure. Uh, and it has a very natural pace. And the way that I write is, uh, I'm what they call in Australia, uh, an extreme pantser, in that I write by the seat of my pants, I don't plot at all. So I sit down, start at page one, and I just keep writing uh, and let the story unfold. Crime fiction lends itself to pantsers because it has a natural breath and a natural structure. And it allows us just to go ahead and let our imaginations run riot. And it's almost because it has a natural structure, keeps control of the story uh, instead of, you know, letting it um, fall off the edge of a cliff. Um, and so, and that's that's how I found myself a, a crime fiction writer. But the other thing about crime fiction is that it allows you to talk about something else. Um, the crime is the scaffolding uh, to allow you to talk about something else. And that's basically, what interests me, power dynamics, social dynamics, um, the, the repeating structures in history or the repeating patterns in history. Um, and so it, I fell uh, into, the, into the genre accidentally, but I stayed there because it suited me. Good, we'll come back to some of that, I'm sure. Teresa, what about in your case? Hang on, hang on, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, in, in my case, actually, I think that I, I didn't choose uh, crime fiction. Uh, it was crime fiction in some way that chooses me. Because when I, when I write uh, A Not So Perfect Crime, the first novel of, of the series, um, the, the first crime fiction novel that I wrote, uh, I didn't think uh, at all that it was a, a crime fiction novel. I thought that I had written a satirical novel about the Catalan society. So it was my publisher who said, no, no, come on, there is a crime here, there is a murder, there is an investigation. So this is crime fiction and we will sell it 
like crime fiction. Uh, of course, at that time, I was, uh, I was a, a completely unknown writer. And I said yes to my publisher, okay? What, what you think is best. And uh, uh, since then, I realized that uh, crime fiction suits me very well uh, because it gives me, as Sulari said, the possibility to talk about uh, a lot of things, different things. Because uh, before uh, writing this novel, I brought other two novels mm -hmm. in a very serious way, uh, talking about very profound things, uh, but I was uh, not happy with these novels. I, I thought that they were not original, uh, not good. And, and then uh, suddenly uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, a couple of um, amateurs, investiga inve investigators, um, uh, detectives, uh, investigating a crime in the Barcelona high society, uh, it was a way to talk about Barcelona society. So mm, that was the, the start. Now, Diana, what about you? Because what led you, what made you decide to, to focus on crime fiction in particular? Uh, well, I, I, I had always been a reader of, of crime fiction, even uh, at a young age, I devoured juvenile crime fiction series, young adult, uh, uh, such as Na the Nancy Drew series. Yeah. Uh, and my, my grandmother was also a very uh, great reader of crime fiction. So she introduced and bought those books for me. And it's interesting what uh, Sulari and Teresa are saying about uh, being struck by how the genre was partly about what the case at hand, but it was always to talk about something else. Uh, and that's what really drew me to crime fiction in the, in the research uh, sense, because it is about uncovering more complex and fundamental social issues and, and having it, having the genre be a vehicle or instrument to express a certain disillusionment or uh, uncovering, revealing certain problems uh, in the current social political situation. And, and with respect to my investigation, which is focused more so on, on women's crime fiction, uh, I, I was interested in how uh, when kind of the perspective shifts uh, to that uh, of a woman, be it a woman detective, an investigator, a private eye, how this really complicated the, the genre as well and problematized uh, pol the politics of visibility in the genre, how women are either made visible or erased or, or exposed. Um, and so women as object to women as subject. Uh, but yes, my interest in crime fiction began at an, at an early age in that sense, and, and noticing what both Sulari and Teresa said as well later on uh, about it being a, a genre that reveals. So, so is it uh, the perspective turning, making woman the subject rather than the object, is that what makes, gives crime fiction its feminine perspective? Um, for in, in the way I've uh, thought of uh, female crime fiction, it's it's precisely that it doesn't uh, necessarily. Yes, in many cases, it, it can be a, a female protagonist or but it can also be the victim or the crime itself, just having it uh, be a kind of a woman centered focus and uncovering certain uh, gender issues or social issues that uh, reveal certain feminist concerns uh, as well. So that's, that's kind of what uh, my research has been in that area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Teresa, your series is set in, and you actually have two series now, you have the, the so-called twins, the Masdeo brothers who, who nobody knows are actually twins or brothers most of the time. Um, so you have those, that series of which there are four novels, um, and then you've started another one, which at the moment, as far as I know, is only available in Catalan, which is the Norma Forrester series. Um, yeah, well, uh, some of them are available in Spanish as well. They are now, okay, all right, but not in English yet. Not in English. Yeah. Now, and not the last one. Uh-huh. As far as I can tell, they're, um, 
they're quite different. Um, the, the twins series focuses more on contemporary Spanish society and in particular high society, although you manage to have the focus shift between them. Whereas I think the, um, the Norma Forrester one allows for a lot more um, reflection also on the past, Spain's historical past. Um, and I'm fascinated, um, and perhaps we can link the two, that Solari also has that historical element to her Roland um, Sinclair series. So um, do you find it different when you're writing the, tw the two different series? Yeah, well, of course, because in the, in the Brothers series, the, the voice is, uh, the voice of the novel is a male protagonist and the novels are written in the first person. So I, I, I write from the perspective of a left-wing male no, that is married with a feminist, that is uh, not a macho at all, but that has this brother that is an upper class, he, he loves upper class, he loves money, he loves uh, rich people. And they work together resolving crimes, no? mysteries. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's this, this contract that I am interested of. And in the case of the Norma series, the Norma Forrester series, these novels are written in the third person. The protagonist is a, is a woman but she is also a police woman. So it's completely different because in the first, in the first novels, in the first series, uh, the detectives are amateurs. And in the second, no, they are professionals. So the issues are, are different. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the issues of the investigation and, but at the end, uh, I'm always writing about uh, issues that, uh, are of my concern, that things that I need to reflect. So basically it's that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And in your case, Sulari, the historical background, uh, you mentioned that it was partly because of your husband's interest, but you know, that, that's one, but there are 10. <laughs> so do you find something in the historical, in being able to use the past, as you said, to reflect on current situations? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things about the 30s is we seem to be doing it again. Yes. Um, and the, the pattern is really, really distinct uh, and clear. So I started, I dipped my toe into the 30s for practical reasons, as I said before, but immediately I was caught by how similar um, the the actual events, the, the social dynamics, the the rise of the cults of personality, the alienation of different sections of society, the polarization of politics, uh, how familiar it all seemed. And uh, a lot of, uh, I begin every chapter in one of my books with an extract from a newspaper of the 1930s. And it's always struck me that some of those articles could so easily be published today mm -hmm. um, and, and apply equally to, to what we're going through uh, as a planet. Um, so it, uh, part, part, of, uh, part of why I write this series is I, I am now invested um, personally in what's going to happen for our, our time and in, in a contemporary context. Um, we know how the 30s came out and what happened. Um, and I'm, I, I think a lot of my writing is an exploration of, was there a point at which we could have jumped off that track where it could have ended differently? Um, because we seem to be making the same mistakes again mm -hmm. uh, in rapid increasing order um, so uh, for, th for those reasons um, I'm particularly intrigued by that era um, it also allows me to actually talk to people about the issues that we're facing today with 
a, a kind of a safety of the lens of history between us. So whereas if you were to write directly about what is um, what is going on today in contemporary issues, there is a certain amount, a certain section of the population who would find that confronting, who would find mm -hmm. that as a, a personal attack. But when you write it in a historical context, you are still raising those issues, um, things like racism and sexism and um, this uh, classism. You're still talking about those issues and their ramifications, but people have the opportunity to listen without the heat of feeling personally attacked. Um, so that's that's why I, I've lingered in the 30s and I'm not finished with it yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you also, uh, with as with Teresa, have fraternal relationships within your novel. You've got two brothers who know their brothers. Um, is it also partly that, because they are quite different, uh, a little bit as Teresa said, one's the sort of the left leaning, the other's the right leaning. Was that in your case deliberate as well or accidental or? Um, it was a little bit of both. I mean, because of the way I write, I don't actually sit down and think it through. Uh, sometimes things evolve and they seem to be a happy chance but I expect that somewhere in my subconscious I'm working it out um, because it does work out so well so I think part of the reason that the fraternal relationships are always really strong in my books is because I'm particularly interested in fraternal relationships I'm one of three girls I married an only child my first experience of a fraternal relationship was when I had my sons so I have two boys um, people will often tell writers, write what you know. I think that's wrong. I think people should write what they're interested in. Uh, and so the way that brothers relate intrigued me uh, because I'd never seen it before. And it's very different to the way that sisters relate and the way that brother and sister relate. Um, so that ended up being the a, cent a central relationship um, in that series. And, and it also allowed me to have Wilfred, the elder brother, represent and voice the establishment and tradition mm. and cast Roland, the younger brother, as a, a progressive man of his time who was interested in doing things the new way and represented uh, a new attitude in Australia. Diana, can I ask you, because you have um, a sort of a historical perspective on crime fiction, um, have you seen generally that these sorts of changes are taking place in terms of the focus and so on, or is it, is it typical of particular moments? Is it uh, particular to certain countries? Do you have a sort of a sense of that? Uh, do you mean with the historical perspective or, or well I, I think something interesting about crime fiction is its fluidity and it, yeah. it uh, it's also contact with with other genres such as the historical historical novels or uh, the urban novel. Um, and I think one thing that I, I have noticed uh, or, or with contemporary crime fiction is that really, uh, with the recent crises, social crises that we've been through, uh, economic of 2008 and all of this, uh, there is uh, always that perspective of, of kind of going, going back, uh, revisiting the past, which is uh, putting into dialogue the current crisis with past crises and uncovering uh, what happened in the past and, and how it relates to the, to the present. What are the ongoing uh, problems? So I, I think that it is something that that it, it just with the, the economic crisis of the of this past decade, uh, it's produced that same sort of cultural necessity to represent similar disillusionment with uh, with the government, uh, with with states that haven't uh, protected its citizens, with preying on. Um, marginalized people, uh, the middle and the lower classes and converting uh, possibly those marginalized groups into uh, important characters in, in crime fiction uh, as well, similar to how it was also done uh, in the past with crime fiction. So it just, uh, 
uh, it's just a, a, always kind of a continual response to what's happening uh, with social reality. And I think, again, why crime fiction is also appealing, because it really mirrors what's happening uh, in contemporary society as well. Mm. And, and do you... I may, I may say yeah. one thing. Yeah. Well, you know, in Spain, for instance, the debate about the past has not ended. We are yeah. still uh, talking about the weight of the past uh, the Francoist dictatorship, especially nowadays that the the right ultra right wing is is in the parliament. So is 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 a very contemporary debate about mm -hmm. what is the past. So I think is uh, is normal that we mm -hmm. writers uh, uh, put all of this debate in our novels. It's just uh, is there. Mm -hmm. and, and just recuperating that sort of memory as well, which I think both uh, Sulari and, and Teresa do in their in their novels uh, as well, which is it, it really important work that crime fiction can also can also do. Have you? It, am I am I wrong in saying or thinking that there are now many more women writing crime fiction than there were in the past? I. I I think there there are there's definitely been a boom in in uh, recent years, uh, recent decades of of women writers, and with that, there's come what what some writers themselves have have said is a renov renovation of the genre itself, kind of maybe going uh, departing a little bit from conventional kind of codes or style. And we see that with uh, with Solari, right? After mm. she wrote him, uh, that's that's a, and also questioning what crime fiction is. is. Uh, yeah. it, it's again, it's not this uh, static genre that doesn't change, but it's it also can be problematized within the the genre and the discussion itself. So, uh, but yes, I I find that there. There are more uh, women writers, which is very exciting, and and seeing uh, them as part of the this important canon of fiction. Yeah. Now you mentioned. I, I, well, okay. Yeah, go no, no, go go go. No, I I wanted to say that uh, men uh, uh, crime fiction men bright men writers are mar much more interested in the debate about what is and what is not crime fiction. You are not really writing crime fiction, you write gray fiction and so on, that woman. I think that is my, my, my feeling uh, when I go to festivals and so on. I mean, women are not so interested in, in, in to put uh, barriers to the gender, to put, you know, mm. uh, but men are interested in Oh, this is crime fiction. This is not because it doesn't follow the rules, no. And yeah. and yeah, I think that crime fiction is a, a, a very. I, I mean, you, you can do a lot of things with with crime fiction. I have very different approaches to the genre. Well, I was I was actually you you mentioned it, Diana uh, Solari, in that your latest one. You actually, it's it's a sort of a self referential text where in the end you don't know. Which is the character? Which is the author? Who is the author? You've got people inventing each other and then interacting with each other as if they really existed. Um, is this a new phase for you? Uh, it was when I wrote that particular book. Um, I had, um, because I had been, I had been writing a long series, and uh, Roland Sinclair as a character is is quite popular as a, a romantic figure uh, almost in, in literature. And so I was um, going to a lot of festivals and I'd be asked constantly about my relationship with Roland. Um, and, you know, that's, that's lovely because what writers, what we aspire to is blurring that line between reality and our imaginations. We want our readers to believe in in our characters uh, but then I but because of these questions I started looking at my own line of uh, of belief and imagination and how much Roland had become a part of my life so after 10 books uh, the character starts to take on a, a real sense of reality and a real sense of independence uh, from 
from you. So I, I'm often fond of saying that if I died tomorrow, Roland would continue to exist because he exists in the, in the imaginations of my readers. Um, and so that, that after she wrote him or crossing the lines, if you're in Australia, was an attempt to consider that, to grapple with that. What if you actually let yourself cross that line? So I know that I played very close to the line between reality and imagination as a writer. Um, but I wondered what would happen if you allowed yourself to cross it. You allowed yourself to truly believe in the people that you made up. And that was just the beginning of the book. And I wrote it much like I write any of my other novels. I just let it unfold and be what it was. But I often, I often think of that book as my love letter to crime writing itself. Um, because for me, it was about the craft and the beauty I find in the actual craft. Um, and the magic I find in being able to allow yourself to believe in something that isn't there. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I, I think that was it. And it, it was initially at the time, it was supposed to be a, a one-off. I was only going to do this once. Um, it was my attempt to step into literary fiction. Um, and then I was going to go back to writing um, the crime uh, fiction series that I love writing. Uh, but since then, uh, it's like any idea, it sparks off other ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I have started writing a, a couple of other me uh, these metafictional manuscripts as a result uh, because there was questions that I didn't quite answer in that one right? or I didn't quite consider properly. So it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things. Despite my best intentions, yes, it might right. be a new phase for me. <laughs> Teresa, you also have in at least one of yours... Um, a sort of a self-referential moment, except that you're the one who appears in your own novel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, as, a, as a writer, I decided to hire my, my detectives to do some research for me because, you know, I, I am a so busy writer that yeah. I, I, I don't have time to make my own research. So in, in this particular book, I wanted the brothers to, 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 do, to do a research about the world of uh, alternative therapies for me. So yeah, and I went to, 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 her, to his office, you know, and talked to them, yeah. It's, uh... Is that likely to happen again? Any more jobs <laughs> for the boys? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know yet, I don't know. <laughs> so, I guess the question, a question you could sort of ask is, um, to what extent is your focus then on raising and examining questions of power, unequal power structures, visibility, invisibility, social inequality, violence against women? Is that really what you want? And the crime is just a tool. So the, the victim, in a sense, is irrelevant. The investigation is, in a sense, irrelevant. Well, in, in my, you, you are asking to me. OK. So, well, I think that okay. this, yeah. OK. I think it's a, it's a mistake to think uh, of literature uh, as a tool to, mm -hmm. to, to make uh, propaganda. I think that that is a mistake. Uh, fiction allows you to talk about reality in a different perspective, perspective that journalists, journalism, for instance. So, uh, despite I, 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 my aim in when I write these novels is to talk about uh, structures of power, uh, inequality, uh, injustices, and so on. I don't think at all that you can that, that crime fiction has to be only a tool to talk about that. I hate this kind of so pedagogical novels that mm. try to say to you what is good, what is bad. For me, it's much more interesting to try to explore why human beings uh, act as we do, 
uh, a way we, we, we behave in, 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 in such way. So, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Diana, you're busy writing things down. Do you, do you want to butt in here? <laughs> No, I was just thinking uh, about what Teresa uh, w was saying and uh, about uh, Noah that I, I agree that it, it really is also about uh, uncovering motives and and mechanisms behind behind what it what is happening and also just uh, being able to to uh, know the psychological reasoning uh, for for characters and also uh, that something I was thinking about some of. Uh, of uh, Teresa's short stories too, where mm. there are characters that are unlikely criminals, like a stitch in time, uh, for example. Which, yes, the 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 topic is the the very important topic about uh, violence against women. But then you have these two older women who who take revenge on an abusive son-in-law. But these are older women who would never hurt anyone. And uh, to understand the, the motives behind that. And what I, just, I was thinking about that short story uh, in particular about what sort of also new criminals, right? Uh, new delinquents we have coming up in, in crime fiction, which can be any one of us. Uh, I was gonna uh, say, yes, any one of us in any given moment or situation, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Larry, you're, is there any element, you've written a trilogy for young, young adults, for uh, readers. Um, was that again, just a, something different? Was it because, you were thinking of your own children or what inspired that? Um, I, I wrote the Hero Trilogy first. I wrote the first book in the Hero Trilogy before I, I started in crime fiction at all. Um, so it was my, my first book. Um, I think when, when, I, when I started writing, and remember I just did it as a complete hobby, <laughs> Um, and I had no idea that it would be a career. I just thought I was dipping my toe in to keep myself entertained while I was writing contracts. Um, and so I went naturally to the kind of stories that um, first made me fall in love with, with literature and, and, and storytelling uh, itself. And when I was a child, I was fascinated by Greek mythology. Um, I went through a, a phase where every, I, I read everything there was to read about Greek mythology. And so it seemed natural to me when I started writing to start there um, at the point where I'd fallen in love with story. Uh, the structure of the, the hero trilogy, like the Roland Sinclair mysteries, is, is written into, well, as the, as the Roland Sinclair mysteries are written into history, the, the hero trilogy is written into um, Homeric legends, so the Odyssey, the Iliad, um, and Virgil's Aeneid. Um, without actually changing those stories, it's just woven into it. They weren't crime fiction, but you, when you look at it, there is that, um, with, with young adult fiction, there's often that, that quest, that so a solution of a mystery that is all part um, of the story, it seems to fall very naturally into that sort of structure. And you could argue that they are crime fictions in the very loosest sense, um, if you were if you were allowing women to define uh, where the boundaries yeah. of crime fiction were. Um, I suppose they would uh, they would be allowed in the back door, uh, but really they're more um, speculative or mythological fiction. Uh, adventure stories. Diana, just a quick question. Have you ever thought of writing crime fiction? Um, I, I've, I've thought about it, uh, but uh, it, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe, maybe someday, uh, but I, I'm more, more of a reader of, uh, of crime fiction at this point, more of a fan. But yes, no, I would, I would love to venture, venture someday, but I'll, I'll, I'd have to try my hand at it, yes. Now, Teresa and Sulari, um, when you're writing, do you have a particular audience in mind, a particular reader in mind? 
Well, um, for me, it's me. <laughs> I, well, let's start with Teresa. Yeah, and then we'll. Yeah. Teresa? Yeah, yeah. well, not, not really. I think that I just write the kind of things that I like to, to read. So no, I'm not thinking in a, in a special target. No. Mm -hmm. So Ari? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not either. I'm, I'm writing the story as the story is. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not thinking about a readership at all or writing towards a readership at all. Um, if anything, the story has got to make me happy. Uh, it's got to keep me interested. So um, I suppose the cliche is that you write the, write the story you want to read. And, and Teresa, when you're writing, you write in Catalan, goes into Spanish, Castilian, and then translated into many, many, many languages. Um, do you ever find that um, there's a change? Do you write your own Castilian version? Yes, I translate okay. myself into, into Spanish, yeah. Does anything change there? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not in the plot, of course, no. but I introduce uh, a, a lot of changes that sometimes then come to the Catalan. Yeah. But I am very grateful that my novels are translated uh, from Catalan, not, not from Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a bunch of translators that know Catalan and and one of the things that I, I think when I am writing sometimes is about translation, you know, yes, because yes. you write, you write a sentence and then I think, oh, how Peter, Peter is my husband, but is also my, my English translator. translator. Yeah. So sometimes I am writing, I'm thinking, oh, uh, Peter, uh, for Peter will be difficult to translate this into, into English, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Still, it's useful for, to be in the same household because you can consult about the process at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the other thing is that uh, Peter is my first reader, you know. Yeah. So when he translates, uh, when he starts uh, translating one of my novels, he already know very well of the process yeah. and has read several drafts and yeah. So do you do lots of drafts unlike Solari? Do you know, you know, when you start, do you have the whole thing plotted out in your head? Yeah, I do a lot of drafts. Yeah. 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 I, I'm a, I am a slow writer. Yeah. And I need and yeah. I need to have all the plot in my head uh, before I start writing. Yeah. And do things ever change dramatically during the writing? Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Solari, you have no idea what's going to happen? You're just writing? Yeah, I'm just writing. I have no idea what's going to happen on the next page. No idea who the killer is. No idea. And sometimes I don't even know who's going to get killed. Um, so it just, I just start. And uh, things seem to just take, happen of their own accord. Um, and and work their way out. So as I was saying, it's, you know, the, the crime, crime fiction genre is a wonderful genre for people who write the way I do in that it has a natural pace and it has a natural momentum and a natural sequence. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for those reasons, um, I can get away with it. Um, I haven't ever, there's, there's always a point at about two thirds of the way through every single novel I write where I think, oh no, I've written myself into a corner. I don't know how this is gonna resolve. I don't know how I'm gonna land this book. And it's at that point where you've just got to take a deep breath and gather your courage and keep writing. And it turns out it resolves um, and it always works out in the end. Um, and I, I tend to be um, a one draft writer. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my publisher gets the first draft uh, of the novel and it tends to work out okay. Um, and I think that's partially because I used to be a lawyer. And so one of the, the things that legal training gives you is 
is the ability or, or, or the training to pick your words precisely in the first place. And so when I put it down on the page, uh, it is exactly what I want to say. Um, and so there doesn't seem to be a lot of need for rewriting or redrafting. Um, the manuscript comes out fairly clean in the first take. Uh, but that's, you know, I mean, there's no right or wrong way to write. It just happens to be the way that I write. Um, I often wonder whether I would have kept writing if I didn't have such a, a relaxed natural technique. Uh, if, if I was the kind of writer who did plot and so on, it, it sounds to me like I would have been too lazy to continue. <laughs> and uh, as it was, I could just sit around in my pajamas and just tell myself a story and it seemed to work. Um, and so I, I kept doing it because why wouldn't you? Um, it, it seemed like a lovely way to spend your life. So, uh, actually, I'm just looking at the time here. Um, Miriam? Let's see if she comes in. Just yes. One, do, we need, do we need to leave, should we leave the rest of the time for questions, if there are any? Uh, you can just go ahead, yeah. Okay. If you're fine, yeah. We are fine to go ahead. We have, like, five more minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, do you start with, in both cases, do you start with um, something that you want to say? Do you start with characters? How do you go about, what, what, what's the, do you start with location? What's the, what's the critical factor for you, for both of you? Teresa? Uh, well, uh... Of course, I think characters are the, the, the more important thing, no? If you okay. have good characters, you can uh, tell a good story. And usually it was that uh, there is some issue that I want to, to write about, no? For instance, the, uh, the alternative therapies, no? I was very concerned about how people believe in this homeopathic remedies or drinking uh, sea, sea water or these things. So I wanted to write a novel denouncing what is behind all of this. Mm -hmm. and, and then I had to imagine a plot. Imagine a plot uh, for not doing just a, a, a mere propaganda novel and, and a plot that tricks the, the reader, no? So mm -hmm. for me, for me, this is one of the funniest parts of uh, writing, to make the plot, how I will treat the reader, how I will uh, uh, captivate um, his attention. No? Mm -hmm. And then once I have the, the plot, just the, the, the skeleton of the novel, then I start writing and putting flesh into this skeleton. You know, mm -hmm. that's my technique. Could you set your novels anywhere other than Barcelona? Are we going to have a series of Oxford, Oxford murders? No, I don't think so, because I am not interested in murders. You know, I am interested in society. So uh, I, I, am, I have been living in Oxford for the past six, seven years, but I, I still live. Still, mm. my, my imaginary is, is there, is in Barcelona. So, and that's, for instance, why my last novel, October, is about the, the referendum that yeah. uh, we celebrate in Catalonia the 1st October, because I was there the days before, and I was there voting during the, the referendum. So in my, in, in my last novel, I wanted to recreate the atmosphere that we live in the city. It's not a novel about independence, against or in favor or against, but it's a novel that try to, the picture, mm. a seat in, in a moment of history. So, yeah. So Larry, you, you suggested that you would prefer to move away from, you, you'd rather deal with the present through the past. Uh, I don't necessarily mean that I'd rather deal with the present through the past. Uh, what I meant to say was that dealing, it, it is a good 
good technique of dealing with the present through the past. It is a way that you can have a conversation and open a conversation with the reader. And, and as Teresa said, writing propaganda, writing polemics, yeah. it doesn't work. It's no, you know, it, there's, there's no point. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't reach people. Uh, if you have something to say and you want to talk us about something, it has to be a conversation with the reader. Um, and dealing with issues from the present through the lens of the past is a really good way of opening that conversation uh, without having people um, recede into their corners uh, from the outset. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to actually talk to people about what the world may look like from the other side mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and from uh, from another perspective. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't necessarily want to uh, cloak what I believe about present issues through the past. Uh, I just think that in terms of novels, it's a really good way uh, to explore current situations by looking at what led to them and where those patterns have existed in history before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Diana, do you do you feel that the can, the present focus on issues to deal to do with women, violence against women, and so on is that something that that is going to become a, an important feature of crime writing? I, I... I, I, I get I, I agree with what Teresa and Sulari have said that it's it's uh, right to that it's not about uh, no. wanting to write about that certain topic and having to include it, uh, but it's a uh, part of our reality and so it, it it's making its way into into crime fiction, but just like other topics are as well, uh, as we see in both yeah. of their works, right? Uh, just even something with uh, with After She Wrote Him, Madeline is dealing with uh, a past miscarriage, uh, you yeah. know, and just, just a, a topic, a, a realm of topics. Uh, but but yeah, it's making its way because it's, it's crime fiction, like we've said, is it really, reflects what's what is happening in, in mm. Mm. now I think Stuart has a question I have um, there are a couple of questions uh, the first one is actually directed towards uh, Lilith um, and that is <laughs> will you be translating the third installment in the Bruna Husky trilogy um, ah. today's is inserting herself into her novel reminded me of Rosa Montero's predilection for doing this but but rarely in a flattering way Mm, yes, indeed. Uh, look, it's it's written. Uh, we've certainly talked about it uh, at the moment. We can't. Amazon has decided that the interest in the first two wasn't strong enough to do a third. So, I think we'll have to see if we can find somebody else to do it. Okay. And then we've got uh, another question uh, in in Spanish. I'll read it out. It should be translated. Uh, El proceso de creación de la novela negra es parecido para mí. A la confección de un puzzle. Me pregunto cuál es la pieza principal para el autor a la hora de iniciar el proceso creativo. Now, I'm not sure that Sulari was plugged into the English translation of that. I have no idea. Okay, Stuart, do you want to? Uh, so the uh, the process of of, of of the creative process in a in a crime novel is very similar to um, uh, making a, a puzzle. Uh, it seems to me, um, no, I ask what is, the, what is the, the principal piece or the main piece that, a, that an author needs to be able to uh, initiate this creative process? What's your starting point in other words? Well, in my case, the characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Always characters, yeah. Same for you. I, I'm the same. I, I... Yeah, I I feel like what I do is I choose a situation and I throw characters into that situation and let them behave as they would naturally behave. And then I follow them and write down what they do. So so how many, so for instance, in, in, in both of your cases, did you come up with the twins as twins from the start? Or the brothers in the case, in your case, Solari, and then add other characters around them? 
Well, yes, in, in the case of the twins, uh, just the fair sentence of the novel come to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, from this very first sentence, I built the rest of the novel, no? Mm -hmm. We are, the, the first sentence is, 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 we are twins, but nobody knows. Was... My brother has another name, blah, blah, blah. So from that, I, I, I built the rest of the novel. And in the case of the Norma Forrester series, uh, I, 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 I wanted to, to have a female character, you know, yeah. because mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted, so I just imagined this character and around her, I built the rest of the of the characters. So did you have to do more research, background research in her case because she was an actual policewoman? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I interviewed a policeman. I visited uh, the morgue. Mm -hmm. You know, I have uh, contact with forensic doctors and all this stuff. Yeah, but then mm -hmm. at the end, you know, uh, crime fiction is is fiction, so mm -hmm. you can. You can just uh, reproduce the police procedures in a novel because that is very boring. So you have mm. to compromise always. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I've been told that we are, our time is up, sadly. Um, now, um, I should mention that for those who want to hear the next two round tables, which will be in Spanish, there will be uh, eventually a version put out with subtitles on YouTube. So once that information is available, I'm sure the Cervantes Institute will uh, put that information out there. But in the meantime, um, thank you very much, Teresa, Diana, Sulari, uh, for a fascinating discussion. I've certainly learned a lot in reading up about you and reading your novels uh, and your, your book, uh, Diana, in particular. Um, so, Thank you very much and thank you to the Cervantes for organizing and for, to Stuart for putting the whole thing in place and uh, on with the show in a week's time, I guess. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, everyone.